Well, I want to say something about uh, <laughs> mask again, just for a brief moment before we jump into Hebrews 13. And, uh, you know, part of the way the elders have navigated down this is realizing that everybody has her own way of trying to figure this out and their own circumstances that uh, determine whether they should wear masks and whether they shouldn't wear masks, whether they should be around people with masks. And we have very much chosen to let each of you uh, make that decision based upon however you want to make that decision. And, um, and so what that means when we come together is that if you believe uh, that it's best, a best practice for you to wear a mask and be around those who are wearing masks, then just simply wear your mask. And those of us that uh, don't typically wear one, we'll put one on to come and engage you and talk to you. Uh, and, um, and so that's kind of where we've defaulted on this thing. Now, this is, the church is not the place to make a point and to prove a point that you don't have to wear a mask or otherwise. So just get over that and view others as more important than yourself and, uh, and meet them where they are. And let's just keep being really gracious to each other because, I mean, this is a tricky deal. Uh, it's kind of like, why are you wearing those clothes you're wearing today? Those are the stupidest set of clothes I've ever seen. No, we don't, we don't view each other that way, do we? We view each other in eyes of grace and just merciful, and we consider others as more important than ourselves. So, um, okay? All right, turn over to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. Now, I suspect that all of us here today and those in the overflow and those online have all been students, right? All of us have been students by this stage of our life. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the learning curves for students is to understand how important homework is. Yeah, some of you groaned even when I said that word. And, and uh, I think most of us have begrudgingly come to understand that homework is helpful, especially if you have a good teacher. Uh, homework helps you get ready for the test, but the point of the test is not to get a grade on the test. The point of the test even is to help realities that we do not know about become the way we see and think and view the world and then live consistent with it. And so, you know, one of the huge steps in maturity is to see homework for its intrinsic value. Now, some teachers encourage that by what? Giving credit for homework. But the point is really not to get the credit. The point is the intrinsic value of the homework is to help us to learn something about realities so that that becomes part of who we are and the way we function in life. And some teachers do not give credit because they feel that the intrinsic value of doing homework ought to be motivation enough. Well, last Sunday morning uh, with one of my college kids, uh, they said to me, I did the wrong homework assignment. I did the one that's due next time, not the one that was due, I don't know if it was last night or whatever. And so then the question is, should they do that past homework assignment? And, and here's the point. The teacher doesn't give any credit for late homework. So then the question comes down to, will it help you learn the material? I mean, that's the bottom line question, right? We often don't think about it that way, but that's the reality. Will it help you learn the material? That's more important than the grade. The grade will probably follow, though, quite frankly. It typically does. And, uh, and, and that's the way it is with the Christian life. In Hebrews chapter 12, we looked at this description beginning in verse 22 of the reality in which we live. Now, it's not fully our experience yet. It will be when we take our final breath. But the experience that we live in, if you will, the kingdom of God that we live in, and this marvelous description of this reality if we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that is the reality that we've come to Mount Zion. We've come to the city of the living God. I mean, this is, this is where we've come. We are there. The heavenly Jerusalem, to a myriad of angels in festal gathering, to the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to all of the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel, it speaks the word, it's finished. This is your ultimate reality. And you read that description, and I mean, what do you say? Wow, blessed be God. What an amazing thing, what you have brought us into. Now, the Christian life then is learning to see our lives and see the world and see eternity that way, that way. And that's no easy task because we have a lot of inputs that say otherwise. In fact, I would say most of the inputs say otherwise unless we've totally reorganized our lives to be a Psalm 1 kind of life. And, and so God gives us homework. He gives us homework to do, and there's no credit. The credit for all of that has been given to us by Christ. We've already got 100%. We're already fully in. The point of the homework is to live in this reality, to live in the reality that is really ours because of what Christ has done for us. And this homework is as difficult and takes as much work as any other homework. In fact, sometimes it's a little messier because it has to do with our hearts and people. But, but just this is the homework assignment. Now, the general homework assignment is in verse 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, isn't that the coolest thing? We have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Here's the homework. Show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Or as we've kind of captured it, gratefully worshiping slash serving. And the reason I put that in there like that is because this particular word for worship implies serving. It's what the priest would do in the temple. And so it's not just praise. It's praise and doing things, and it's a combination of that, but gratefully worshiping and serving God. That's the homework assignment. Now, that's a little bit like saying addition is where you take parts and you put them together into a whole. Now, how do you know what addition really is? By saying 20 plus 12 equals 32 or by actually doing specific problems. That's where you learn what that means, that addition is taking parts and putting them all together and seeing them as a whole. Well, verse 28 is a general description of the homework assignment. And what he does in chapter 13 is he gets very specific, very specific. And we looked at the first three last week. Here's your homework assignment. Let love of the brethren continue. Let the Philadelphia, let the tender affection for your brothers and sisters in Christ continue. That's a homework assignment. It will be a homework assignment until we take our final breath. Secondly, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this some of you have entertained angels without knowing. And that's that word philo again. And strangers, love of strangers by using our homes and showing hospitality. That's a homework assignment. Third one is remembering the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourself are also in the body. And so remembering people in prison and those who are being ill-treated. Now, why do we do those things? Not to earn any credit before God. We earn those because that's life in the unshakable kingdom of God. 
That helps us see and understand and live in the reality of what God has given to us. Well, here's two more for us this morning. Marriage and money. Marriage and money. Just say ouch before we even begin. Yeah. Um, this, this is a homework assignment that, especially in our culture, can take a lot of work. And so let's look at these this morning. Let me read verses 4 through 6. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Let's pray together. Spirit of God, we thank you for uh, being present today and, and helping us to understand more fully of who we are in Christ, and specifically on the area, area of marriage and mater- money and material goods. And Lord, with both of these, um, it's, it's really easy for us to miss some of the realities that you have for each one of us. And so, Spirit of God, we just look to you, and we trust you to do a holy work in each of our lives and hearts to say, you're you're right on in this particular area. Well, this area, you got some work to do. And uh, and to, to let us experience both of those under your hand today. And it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's jump into marriage here. Now, with both of them, you will notice that there's really two commands and then a reason to encourage us or to motivate us, if you will, to do the homework and and to do what the command says. So first of all, marriage, here's the two commands, hold it in honor among all. Marriage is to be honored by all people. And the second command The marriage bed is to be undefiled, unpolluted, and here's the reason. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Boy, is this a good word for us today in our culture today. Marriage. Marriage has always been under attack. It's the first thing we might say that God did human relationally in the Garden of Eden. He said that Adam wasn't good for him to be alone. That could be said for a lot of us men. Um, And so he created Eve. He brought Eve to Adam. And his words were, wow, this is it. Someone just like me. I've been looking at those animals all day long. And God says, for this reason, because of that. A man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And Jesus, when he was asked about divorce in Matthew 19, he went right back to that, and he added this, what God has put together, let no man separate. And so, Marriage is an institution that was created before governments, before business, before schools, before sports clubs, before, just name anything you want to name, before houses, before anything. Marriage was there in the very, very beginning. And it's obvious as you go through the scriptures that marriage was intended to be a core. It was intended to be a center of gravity around which all of life experiences the beauty of God and His good ways. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody has to be married. That's not what this is saying. But what it is saying is every follower of Jesus Christ has to hold marriage on a pedestal. They have to hold it as a cherished thing. They have to honor marriage. 
And for those of us that are married, we must take our personal marriage and keep it on the pedestal. Because marriage predates everything else that can easily suck our hearts away and cause us to actually dishonor our marriage. Because God designed and created marriage, it's no surprise that it has been under attack, and that's where Satan made his first attack. His first attack was on the relationship of Adam and Eve as a husband and wife. And because of their sin, part of the judgment that God imposed upon people was this power struggle within marriage in Genesis chapter 3. And so the f- Satan probably doesn't even have to be very involved in destroying most marriages today. It just really comes right out of our hearts. And then the culture gives all kinds of really wicked advice and pictures because it does not hold marriage in honor. Even during the early days of Christianity, and well, it's still present today, isn't it, in some groups, celibacy was seen as more godly than marriage. And even some of the church fathers that are often quoted, uh, that was a reality. Paul addressed this when he wrote his letter to Timothy. He said, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose conscience are seared who forbid marriage. The rest of it has to do with foods and other things. But one of the things, even within, which beginning to sneak into Christianity is it's more godly to be single than married. And, um, and that's, that's not true. That's not true at all. Of course, in many godless cultures, marriage is seen as a very limiting societal structure which needs to be abolished. That was true in the Roman Empire to a large extent. Is it present in American culture? Oh, you better believe it. Our governor doesn't have a wife, I suppose you know that. He has a first partner. And so the attack on this is, oh, huge in our American culture today. Or it's being modified to where it's not in the beginning. God created them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. Now, while many will shout down the central role of marriages in forming a law-abiding citizen, even if you just want to look at the statistics and find that the most common reason that most people are incarcerated is because of issues in their home, issues in their parenting and who their parents were. Interestingly enough, I think historically, as you follow the scriptures through, you can make the case that God had to create government because marriage was failing so bad. Marriage is there in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Government doesn't come until after the flood in Genesis 9. The implication is, is if marriage would live out and fulfill its ultimate purpose, you could not even need government. Now, wouldn't that be a crazy world to live in? My point is, I don't want to get off on that sidetrack, but the point I want to make is, is that uh, you've probably all played Jenga, right? And the point of Jenga is what? Not to pull out that one that causes it all to come collapsing down. The thing that causes cultures to come collapsing down is to not hold marriage in honor. Doesn't mean you have to be married, but to not hold marriage in honor is the thing that causes the collapse. It causes a collapse because birth rates drop, and all of a sudden you don't have an oncoming generation. 
it collapses because children are not raised in a place where character and moral values in one anotherness is cultivated to where they can be contributors as they grow up and become adults. And so, boy, we just see the wisdom here of God's word, don't we? Marriage is to be held in honor among all. The next little phrase deals with a particular gift that God has given for the sake of those who are married, the gift of sex. Genesis chapter 4, 1 says, And Adam knew his wife Cain, knew his wife, ay, ay, ay. Adam knew his wife Eve, and Cain was born of that. Oh, man. Just trust the Bible more than what I say, okay? <laughs> and, and there, caught up in that verse, are really the two purposes for the sexual relationship, that a husband and wife would know each other. There's an intimacy and there's a knowingness that happens in that, and that children would come out of that unless God has other plans. And so that means that the gift of sex is intended as a specific gift for a husband with his wife and a wife with her husband, and only there. And you say, well, how do you know we're talking about that? Well, look at the next part of verse 4. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Fornication is the very general term for sexual sin. The, the word is actually pornos, which we'll recognize from pornography. And it would refer to any sex outside of a husband with his own wife and a wife with her own husband. Adultery is specifically for those who are married being involved outside of their marriage. And so it's very obvious that that is what is being talked about here. And, and what a vivid way to put this, isn't it? What a vivid way to put this. The marriage bed is to be undefiled, unpolluted. The only place to experience what God intended with the gift of sex is between a man and his own wife, a wife with his, her own husband. Anything else pollutes the marriage bed. Is that a graphic picture? I mean, that's like bringing sand and putting it in the bed. That's what that does. And, uh, and so there's this command to make sure that doesn't happen. Now, a couple other passages here. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, uh, they were married, but they believed, some of them believed, that even though you're married, you shouldn't open up and use this gift of sex. And so he wrote this, because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. It's very obvious that's talking about opening up this gift of sex that God has given to a husband and wife. And so any sexual participation outside of with one's own wife or with one's own husband defiles, dirties the marriage bed, so to speak. And then you talk about a motivator to not do this. Look at the last part. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Notice it doesn't say God might judge. It says God will judge. Now, he has a lot of ways of judging. And his judgment always perfectly fits what we know and how high-handed our sin is. Romans 1 describes his judgment on cultures where he just lets them go down this path and perversion multiplies. We know that on a personal level, there's the physical diseases, there's the dirtying of the conscience, the complications it brings into a marriage relationship. There's just a lot of things. Our job is not to figure out how he will judge, but just to know he will judge. 
And so my word to all of us would be that if we are involved in this, our greatest concern not, should not be that we might get found out. Our greatest concern should be that God knows and he will judge. He will judge. And thankfully, as we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, there's our two, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And here's the beautiful grace of God. And such were some of you. But you were, what's it say? Washed. Isn't that a beautiful term? You were washed. You were polluted. <laughs> you were dirty. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And what about all those who are not washed, who continue to live like this? At the very end of the Bible, the last chapter, we see this huge contrast. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. And that washing is the work of Christ. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. The fact that we live in a culture that is so immoral should force us to do two things. One is make sure that we hold marriage in high honor and we make sure that we don't pollute the marriage bed. And secondly, to be grieved and brokenhearted over people who are, have stolen a gift that God has given and intended for a specific place and are using that gift in very destructive ways. This is their fate. They need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> they need to know the gospel. They need to be developed to know this reality and to come to Christ and be washed before it's too late. Amen? All right, well, let's go on to another easy subject, money. <laughs> money. Again, we have two commands and then a statement. And while the other one was a negative statement about God's judgment, here we go to the other extreme. So here's the two statements. Make sure that your character, some of your translations will say, make sure your life is free from the love of money. If you have a New King James, Old King James, it'll say free from covetousness. So that's one statement. Being content with what you have. And then here's the reason. He himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so make sure that your character is free from the love of money. And uh, as we probably need to constantly be reminded, money and material things are not the problem. <laughs> it's our heart that's the problem. And here we see this word philo again. Uh, it, it's an affection. It's a desire for. It's an attraction to. Uh, the glitter of having a bank account and how much is in there or, or uh, whatever material goods and, and things that there might be. Um, Charles Spurgeon, the, the well-known preacher from the 1800s in England, said this, I've been in a lot of testimony meetings and I've heard a lot of people share how they've sinned and I've had people come to me and make confession of sin, but in all my life I've never had one person confess the sin of covetousness to me. You probably know this, but there's more written on this than most other sins in all of the Bible, and yet it's probably the one of the hardest to understand if we're guilty of. Now, fornication, adultery, okay, that one's pretty clear-cut. I shouldn't say pretty. That's clear-cut. 
But this one's, this one's trickier. How much is enough? How do I know if I'm too consumed in my bank account, too consumed in my retirement account, too consumed in my home, my shark, whatever it might be? How do I know all that? And uh, I don't have a simple answer for you. I do know that the Spirit will put His finger on this area of our heart if we really want to know. I do know that one of the greatest indicators, if we're okay, is what happens if whoosh, it goes away, or someone hits our car, or a tornado comes through and takes our house. That's not our issue here, but I do know that our responses to loss often reveals where our heart is. And, uh, and so we need to pay attention to some of that stuff. Um, and, and just remind ourselves that love of money is not a matter of how much you have, how much I have, uh, because people on the street that are homeless can be just as uh, covetous as people that are living with all kinds of wealth. So it doesn't have anything to do with amount. It has to do with the heart's attraction to these kinds of things. So let's just go through some scriptures. Maybe God will use his word as he often does. Job said this, If I've made gold my trust or called fine gold my confidence, if I have rejoiced because my wealth was abundant or because my hand has found much, this also would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges, for I would have been false to God above. We're going to see this theme run through that is so poignantly brought home here for us that that if we... The question kind of boils down to this. Is God enough? Is God enough? And so, here he's saying, if I've done all that, then God wasn't enough. I've been false to God. David said, if riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. One of the Proverbs says, money makes wings like an eagle, the fastest bird, and flies away. Ecclesiastes Solomon, another wealthy man. These are all wealthy people so far who have spoken. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Jesus said, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist in his possessions. And uh, 1 Timothy 6, flip back just a few uh, pages and go to 1 Timothy 6 because here it says the same thing. 1 Timothy 6, beginning of verse 6. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil." And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Jump down to verse 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. And so we have a beautiful balance there that comes from Paul to his spiritual son, Timothy. So back to verse 5. 
so our life, our character is to be free from the love of money, and the opposite of the love of money is being content with what we have. Contentment it just simply means to be satisfied. It means you just breathe in easy. It means there's not anxiety, there's not worry. There aren't, there's no disturbance over money or material things. Uh, to me, it's a picture of taking a deep breath and just constantly saying, enough, enough, enough. Arthur Pink, a commentator from a generation before us, says, contentment is the product of a heart resting in God. Or as I said a few minutes ago, love of money or lack of contentment is ultimately a distrust in God. It's ultimately saying, God, you're not enough. You're not enough. And notice why we can be content. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. And notice the double there. It doesn't just say he has said. It says what? He himself has said. That's just hammering or doubling down, if you will, that don't be ambiguous about this. Be clear about this. He himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. And what's the next phrase do? It just simply is our taking what he has said and saying, you're right. You're right. I believe what you say. So we confidently say, let's read this last part together. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? The Lord's enough. The Lord is enough. And we all know that. But our homework assignment is to keep saying that and to live more in that reality. And don't we have a good father that he just knows how to reveal where our love is? And he reveals it sometimes by taking away. He reveals it by giving. He does all of those things. And more important than the things is what is our heart response to those things? Do we think we're better off because we have a house and not having a house? Or has God enough? When we lose something, what's our response? And I'll just tell you, I have failed this homework assignment many times. But I want to get better at it. And I'm going to keep doing my homework. It reinforces the reality that we all know. People will turn on us. People will take our things or they're going to get lost trying to pay back a several trillion dollar federal budget. I mean, who knows? Well, actually, what do we know? We confidently say, let's say it together. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Now, here's the naked reality. All of the things that I have, all of the things that you have are going to be left behind. As the crass saying says, there are no U-Hauls behind the hearst. And when we come to that moment, if we have Jesus, we have everything we need. He's the one who takes our final breath away and moves us into the fullness of the heavenly Jerusalem and the festal gathering of all the angels and all the spirits who have been made perfect and the church of the firstborn and to God our judge and to Jesus who has mediated this new covenant and whose blood has said, he got 100%. She got 100%. Jesus is enough when we take our final breath. The challenge for us is to live like that all the way until that time. And that's why Job said, in the midst of such distress, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So two areas 
of homework for each of us. Let me just give you a moment to respond to the homework assignment before your Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Spirit. So would you bow your heads and let's pray. Just respond to him based upon what his word and his spirit have pointed out to you. Lord, we want to thank you for loving us so much that you have been very specific in these two areas of our life and that you don't just lay the test on our desk, but you are there and you're helping us be successful at completing these homework assignments, not so that we would be liked by you anymore, but just so that we could live more in the realities of your kingdom that you have granted to us that is absolutely unshakable. So Spirit of living God, grow us in each of these areas for your great name's sake. And it is in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.